Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for attending. We have a good crowd here this afternoon and on Zoom as well. Um, so this is now the fourth of the lectures on our six lecture program. And I would like to introduce Dr. Gabriel Prieto. Prieto. Dr. Prieto is an assistant professor in the UF Department of Anthropology, whose primary research interest is the study of ancient coastal maritime adaptations, especially on the north coast of Peru. A closer example of a culture adapted to living off the resources and the food offers offered by prolific coastal areas is the Southwest Florida Calusa complex encountered by the Spaniards and displayed in dioramas at the Florida Museum. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's well worth the visit. And I'll put in a plug for the Florida Museum. It is now among the top five natural history museums in the country. And their resources, their collections, are the largest of any university associated natural history museum. Professor Prieto's recent focus has been on the long-term trends of domestic settlements and mortuary practices among small fishing communities of the Peruvian coast, and in response to dramatic El Nino climate shifts and resulting population migrations. He also investigates ritualized human violence in ancient times, particularly the ancient Peruvian practice of child and animal sacrifice. Dr. Prieto took his PhD in anthropology from Yale, specializing in Andean archeology. span And in fact, he teaches a course on Andean archeology, span the Inca and their ancestors, uh, which will be next fall. He was a member of the faculty of the Universidad Nacional de Trujillo until joining UF in 2019. Dr. Prieto is from Trujillo, and I would note that it's a beautiful Spanish colonial city on the north coast of Peru. Dr. Prieto, please. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing today? Good. I just had my coffee, so yeah. Um, um, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank Phyllis. We met a, a few months ago during a um, talk for the American Institute of Archaeology, and she was very kind for inviting me to give you a presentation on my current research, but also on um, some general aspects about pre-Hispanic Peru. So I'm going to introduce myself very briefly. I'm just going to tell what, well, you have already said a lot, <laughs> but um, how I uh, get engaged in archeology span and why I'm studying the uh, sites and the region of the North Coast of Peru that I'm going to talk about this afternoon. And um, I'm sure that everyone is familiar with this pictures, raise your hands, the ones that do not know what this site is. Okay, just a few. This is uh, Machu Picchu, it's one of the seven wonders of the world, and it was built by the Incas back in the 15th century. Now, many people think that this is a city, but this is actually a royal palace, a royal state built by the Inca nobility to um, spend the summertime. And uh, it would be something like Camp Davis, I would say, something like that. So, uh, but today is a major tourist attraction. And when, when you hear about South America, where you hear about Peru, you always hear about Machu Picchu or the Nazca Lines. I am not going to talk about these sites today. I, <laughs> I'm going to show you what I do on the north coast of Peru. This is a region that not many people know, at least in the western and northern hemispheres, but it has great archaeology and it's helping us to learn a lot about the uh, predecessors of the Incas, but also learn about social complexity in this part of the world. Um, but before going there, 
Uh, I want to introduce a short video um, about Peru, and this is going to be a very quick survey of all the cultures that antecede the Incas. And this is going to be dramatic, you know, with voices like this. And But I think it's an excellent job done by the Peruvian government to promote our ancient cultures. In a world where the sun walked the earth, where gods were hidden within stones, An empire where the immensity of magical lakes blended with cities that were born from the earth. And the bravest of warriors traveled from unknown oceans to fortresses hidden. Isn't that good? <laughs> so um, this, this short video has a big mistake. And it's not 5,000 years. It's actually 10,000 years. So some of the oldest uh, evidence of human presence in this continent, besides the recent discoveries here in the US that goes push back to 20,000, um, we have evidence of 12,000 BP, so around 12,000, 10,000 years before Christ um, living in this part of the continent. So, so you can imagine all this cultural and social development over the years. And then, of course, every region is different. Now, we are going to focus into the uh, North Coast. But before that, let me give you a very brief intro to the area, of course, South America. And the central portion is present-day Peru. But we have Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, the Guyanas, and Ecuador here. So uh, the Andean Mountains is one of the largest uh, mountain systems in the world. And its central part right here, where Peru happens to be, you know, condensed some of the most diverse um, regions and ecological areas in the world. If you see this in a cross section, um, this is how children are taught in, 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 in Peru to understand the topography of the, of, the, uh, of the country. So we have on the on the left side, on the west side, the Pacific Ocean, and on the other end, the uh, tropical forest of the Amazon region. And then, you know, the Andes are these huge mountains that goes from, you know, zero meters above sea level all the way up 
to uh, sometimes up to 50,000 feet above sea level. So uh, people here over these 10,000 years have adapted themselves to create some of the most diverse cultures around the world. Just to give you an idea of the cultural diversity, when the Spanish came to this region in the 16th century, there were around 50 languages. These are not dialects, but different 50 different languages spoken by the people just between the, uh, the, um, the highland regions and the coast. And then in the Amazon forest today, there are still another 40 something languages of different native communities. This is the time when the, when the Spanish came, the Incas already imposed Quechua language. So many people were losing their original languages because of the Incas imposing a new political economic system. So we can just even imagine how many other languages have been lost over you know, the last 500 years. So this diversity is the result of these uh, very diverse environments. Now, um, Peru, it's, it's a modern country. It has lost maybe 50% of its original territory due to many 19th century wars with all the neighbors. We, we are the great losers in this process, I have to say. I think it's the Inca revenge. You know, the Incas were before taking over and now it's our turn. And, uh, and I would like to focus on the coast. So the Incas started here where Cusco and Machu Picchu are located, but we are going to talk about the coast. Now, the coast of Peru is a very dry area, highly influenced by the Atacama region, the Atacama Desert, one of the driest in the world, and also by the Pacific Ocean that is influenced by the Humboldt Current, which is a very cold water current that makes this area, although we are very close to the tropical area, to the equator, it's still very dry and cold. On the one hand, that's a big problem for you know, um, um, practical reasons, but on the other hand, it's really made these areas one of the most fertile in the world due to the very low rain average. So just to give you an idea, in a regular year, perhaps only a couple of inches per year is what we get. So when there is heavy rain, the heavy rainfall is an El Nino phenomenon, and I hope that you are familiar with El Nino, this climate anomaly. So, uh, and then there is a system of about 24 rivers, but these are very tiny rivers. They really look like little creeks, you know, flowing from the highlands but they are so rich in minerals and, and soil and clays that all of that has been deposited over thousands of years. And then the coastal valleys are very rich. Now for archeologists, it's paradise. It's, it's Universal Studios, it's Disney World. Because it's so dry that all the organic materials are beautifully preserved. So we have textiles that goes back to 5,000 years ago, corn cobs of 6,000 years old. And I can, I, can, I can just go all the way explaining how many artifacts we have with that degree of preservation. Now, the highlands is, is, is very different. You know, it's this dramatic environment with very diverse and very different altitudes. And we move from glaciers where people are still celebrating religious festivities, usually a beautiful cultural syncretism between Andean pre-Hispanic traditions and, and modern Catholic uh, um, traditions. This one is one of my favorites, is Koyu uh, Riti, that's uh, spoken in Quechua language, and that means the shiny star. And it's, it's, a, it's a celebration that takes over a month and people, you know, were, um, they pilgrim to this area and then they walk all the way up to this glacier to take pieces of ice. And then they bring that piece of ice back, those blocks back to their, to their uh, communities. And they use that as sacred water to bless different things 
Today, the Peruvian government is prohibiting this practice because of climate change. There is not much ice left, so they can't bring the blocks back to their communities, but it's still very colorful and a lot of traditions merge in these kind of traditions. Then they are basically farmers. They grow different kinds of plants, and probably you know this, but the Andes is perhaps one of the cradles for uh, food uh, for plant domestication around the world. All the potatoes that you have came out from the Andes. Uh, well, well, the vast Andes territory. I'm not saying that just Peru, of course, but I would say that there is around 3,000 varieties of potatoes. Uh, some of them, most of them are native species, but if you go to Peru, you will learn that we have potatoes for fries, potatoes for smashed potatoes, potatoes for soup, potatoes for stews, you know. So you can imagine how I'm suffering when I'm trying to find potatoes in Trader Joe's or, you know, when the paycheck comes, I try to go to Whole Foods, but it's still like I can't find what I need, you know. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an area with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, work put by local and, and, and native communities who have basically did a lot of genetic transformations intentionally and possibly non-intentional over thousands of years to get this diversity of food. Of course, maize, many Mexicans and Central American people claim the origin of you know, maize from this region, and it certainly is, but the Andes also has a large variety and recent papers in science are demonstrating that potatoes, that sorry, that, that maize was also originated in the Americas more likely, most likely uh, the central region where is present day Peru. These little fellows, uh, guinea pigs, were also domesticated in present day, at least the oldest evidence comes from present day um, Colombia, not actually the central Andes, but from Colombia. And, you know, they were domesticated for food. So in Peru, it's a very regular uh, dish that is served in any restaurant. I mean, my my parents love guinea pigs. I like guinea pigs. So I love when I teach at UF and show this picture to my students. <laughs> um, two years ago, we ran a, a field school program uh, with my students and we have 17. And there were three or four of them who asked a cooey, that's what we call guinea pigs, cooey, uh, you know, as, 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 as the main dish at, 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 on lunchtime. They, they did like it, they enjoy it, you know, the, 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 the meat is a little kind of chewy, but it tastes like chicken and it depends on the preparation, it's not bad. You know? So when I asked back, so what do you think? They said, well, we like it, but I wouldn't ask that dish again. <laughs> so, you know, it's of course, guinea pigs very important in the economy, you know, not only as pets, but as a source of proteins, and, um, and, and, and and a good companion. And of course, the majestic llamas, camelids, as you know, very important for uh, wool, meat, transportation. The only beast of burdens in the area uh, are, are llamas. So um, those were also domesticated in the central Andean region, uh, probably around uh, six or 7,000 years ago. Um, currently, uh, we have a postdoc from um, from Paris, she's from La Sorbonne and the, and the Museum of Natural History, and she's working with me. She's using 3D scanners to um, scan the talus and the and the phalanges of camelids, trying to see if we can actually figure out with these measurements uh, the moment where camelids diverge, and we have the domesticated ones, alpaca and llama from Huanaco and Vicuña, which are the uh, wild species. So we'll see what comes out of that research soon. And uh, perhaps the most important aspect for this conference is that this region was considered sacred. It was transformed by humans. They considered the big mountains as their ancestors, the residence of the spirits that basically run the world. As you know, uh, the Central Andean region is located in the circle of fire, which means constant tremors and earthquakes. You know, I, in a way, I kind of joke with my songs. I have a 10-year-old and a 
five year old every time they do a drill for you know a shotgun for gunshots and things like that i say well when i was a kid in peru we used to do the drills for the earthquakes you know and, and those happens almost every month so it's part of of our culture there so that that shaking of of the land you know made the andean people to believe that they have to worship the mountains in order to keep a nice balance so you know it's it's, it's a very nice combination of um, venerating the landscape trying to keep a sustainability in terms of the exploitation of the resources and so forth so um keep that in mind when i come back to my uh to other cases that i'm going to show and of course they have transformed the landscape. Um, they create these uh, and andenes. These andenes are basically these agricultural terraces that give some stability to these mountains and prevent erosion. And that's where the name was taken to name the Andes. So these are andenes and then the Andes mountain, the Andean mountains. And some of them are very, some kind of fantastic engineer behind perfect circles uh, where they have a very nice control of the temperature and they were growing, this is during the Inca times, they were growing different plants from different regions in these in this kind of facilities. But as I said, I'm going to talk about the coast of Peru and particularly about the north coast of Peru. So this is the north side of my hometown. The name is Juan Chaco, so you can just use the name number one and Chaco. Juan Chaco, so maybe you can tell this. Juan Chaco, right, right. So this is the north side and um, I grew up here and uh, I was born in this area. My family came probably in the 19th century, half of my family, the other half were from the local, from the area. And um, as a child, I grew up in the 1980s. That was the time of the terrorism in Peru. So it was really bad time to be you know, around. So, um, my, and, and Huanchaco is, a, is kind of a, it's like Cedar Key. It's like, a, it's like the beach of a very large city known as Trujillo. So we were living on the beach, was kind of safe there. So instead of going and playing with my friends in Trujillo, I will stay in Huanchaco. So I just, I just got a bike, no Nintendo Switch those times, no, you know, cell phones, right? So I was just biking around and then I, I found myself surrounded by archaeological sites. And later I learned that those were archaeological sites. And because of the looting and you know uh, bulldozing and things like that, there were human bones all over the place and little beads of different colors and ceramic fragments. So that's how I became interested in archaeology. Later on, when I uh, did my PhD, I thought I should go back to my hometown and perhaps dig those sites and learn what's in there. So basically what I'm going to show now is the results of my research over the past 10 years in this, in this area. And if you are interested, you know, uh, we have this uh, co-edited book with Dr. Dan Sandways on maritime communities of the ancient Andes. So we are trying to counter and balance all of that magnificent, very important information from the Incas and, you know, agriculture and herding but if you want to learn more about fishermen and shell gatherers and things like that, you know, this is a book that we just put out a couple of years ago. So this is Juan Chaco. This is my hometown. This is the nice side of the city, of course. And I tried to get a nice picture. And it's, it's, it's world famous because of the reed boats. And people in my hometown are very seriously claiming that they, they are the, 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 the ancestors and the, the creators of surfing. And, and of course, people in Hawaii, they, they don't like this. You know? But I have to say that, that we do have the archeological evidence to support the fact that reed boats have been used since at least 3000 years ago. And these people, they mainly used to actually break the waves and go offshore to, to fish. But on the way back, they like to surf. Uh, so, you know, there may be some, so of course, like everything else, there are multiple areas of origin and certainly Huanchaco. And today Huanchaco is a, a world surfing reserve. There is a surfing destination. You will see surfers all over the place uh, joining. And of course, uh, there are traditions 
again, are mixed with their prehispanic origins, these large uh, uh, rafts made out of, of, of reeds, um, you know, are used during Catholic celebrations, St. Peter's Day on June the 29th, you know, so the, the community has really shifted from subsisting on fishing practices into making all of these as tourist attractions. So people enjoy this and they go there and of course they enjoy the food, right? One Chaco is the perfect place for seafood and, you know, ceviche now consider a world heritage dish in the world, I mean, the preparation process. So possibly one Chaco is also another important place for food, but I have to, my, 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 my fellow Peruvians, they don't like when I say this, but ceviche is not pre Hispanic just by the simple fact that limes, key limes were brought by the Spanish. You know, they didn't grow in, in, in the Americas until the 16th century at least. So no way to cook ceviche. And of course the onions, right? So uh, maybe other ways. The history of this region, as I said, goes back 10,000 years ago, but around 3,000, uh, well, let's say 5,000 years ago, uh, the very first evidence of social complexity became a very important aspect in this, in this part of the world. Caral is the name for one of the first urban settlements in the world, and they built these very large pyramids, of course, a succession of multiple building projects that were built one on top of the other, um, but there were also residences around, and uh, some archaeologists claim that this is the very origins of social complexity, which is at roughly the same time in Mesopotamia, China, and other parts of and, and Egypt as well. Here is another picture of these very large monuments, as you can imagine, a lot of community-based effort, a lot of uh, a lot of effort invested not only in resources but in the amount of people that have been that must have built these these monuments. You know, kind of they call this the amphitheater, uh, circular sunken plazas, and then staircases and a number of room facilities. So this is not just a pile of rocks. This is a very careful planned architecture that again was built five thousand years ago. Um, but moving closer to you know the, the the present times, of course, the Nazca Lines is another major attraction in the north coast, and this is in the south of Lima. But from here, I'm going to focus on the Norte region, the north coast, and um, the time around 200 A.D. and 800 A.D. was the time of the Moche civilization perhaps the closest society to the Western standards in terms of comparing them with the Greeks or the Romans. The Moche people create a very sophisticated state-like society with a number of kingdoms ruling different parts of the valleys and a very hierarchical society. As you can tell, this guy didn't, didn't hesitate to spend all his salary on his clothes, right? And, uh, it must have been very uncomfortable walking with all that gold on him. But if you never heard about the Lord of Sipan, is considered the, the Tutankhamun of the Americas, is the richest burial ever found in the Western Hemisphere with tons of beautiful jewelry, silver, gold, copper, gilded copper, and so forth. Here is another recreation of another important burial, maybe a predecessor of the other guy of the Lord of Sipan. Unfortunately, we don't have um, uh, written documents like the Mayas to know the names of these people or who they were, but certainly they were important members of the society and possibly kind of lords or king, you know, kings. Um, you can go to the, to the north coast of Peru and there is a beautiful museum, the Royal Tombs of Sipan. And this is a museum that, that hosts all of those gold and silver collections beautifully displayed with all the facilities for people to walk and to move with some um, you know, uh, aids and, and, and wheelchairs. And it's really one of the best museums in South America, according to the New York Times. Um, 
the Mochis also built the Pyramid of the Moon. Of course, Pyramid of the Moon is a romantic name. We don't know if this site had a name. We don't know if the site ever got a name. Um, but, you know, this idea of the moon and the sun, so people just name it the Pyramid of the Moon. So this site has been under excavations for more than 30 years now by my former institution, the University of Trujillo. And the director was Dr. Santiago Seda, who unfortunately passed in 2018, but the project keeps running. It's one of the most successful archeological projects in the world. They were 365 a year, and uh, they have a lot of funding. They've been cleaning and excavating all the main plaza. Now, this is an adobe brick made pyramid. So there are thousands of adobe bricks about this big that were used so these are dry mud bricks. These were not baked. These are just adobe bricks. And um, But the monument is certainly uh, one of the wonders of the north coast of Peru. This is a 3D recreation of the monument. And uh, they learned that the main facade was beautifully painted uh, with different motifs that you will see in a couple of minutes. And it has a main ramp so people can walk here and enter into the upper platform and in the main patio, but there were also other areas around. So this is how it looks today. And uh, this picture is a little outdated. Now all of this is exposed. So all the facade, this is the only pre-Hispanic temple in Peru that is completely excavated and open it. The conservation takes maybe 80% of the budget. So they have an army of conservators working on a daily basis to preserve the colors. So when you go there, it's not like being in Pompeii where everything has been repainted and everything here is original. And uh, French scholars have done analysis on the walls and they have found that at least 16 layers of paintings have been added over you know, a period of maybe 200 years to preserve, you know, by the mochis themselves. Uh, this, uh, this site has also a beautiful museum, a site museum where you can see all the findings, the burials, the gold and the ceramics. Uh, people were very expressive in moche art. Um, the moches have some of the most beautiful moche, they call the moche portraits bottles. So they are actually the heads of real people, beautifully done, beautifully crafted. And they also have what they call the Kama Sutra of, of South America. So the Moches were also very expressive in their sexual um, uh, relations and, and, and practices. So if you go to Peru, make sure to visit the Larco Museum in Lima. They have the most beautiful room on what they call erotic uh, art. It's a room about this big with beautiful pots. So you should definitely you know, put a check on it. And this museum has some of them as well. So the museum is a research facility. So they, they, they have constantly grad students, undergrad students, and, and researchers from all over the world working in this site. My other favorite site that is slightly later is Tucume. Tucume is known as the, the, the Valley of the Pyramids. Again, adobe brick. And you can tell how the rain, you know, have kind of eroded the surface of these beautiful monuments. But you know these are huge pyramids from a later period. Um, some of them have been excavated, and they also have very nice facilities, you know, to visit and to walk very safely in these in these in these sites. And it also has a beautiful museum uh, that has been just opened four years ago, right before the pandemic. So uh, they have really good um, uh, sites and museums to see. So I would say that the, the archaeology of the Peruvian North Coast have evolved in a really good way. A lot of professionals, many of them, my former mentors, have invested a lot of resources and they have done all the lobby, you know, to get these facilities. But the good news about these, these, these sites is that everything has been done, not necessarily for tourists, but for the local communities. There are a lot of active research and educational programs to build up, you know, a better sense of, of identity because most of these sites have been heavily looted over the past you know, 300 years. 
So creating a new sense in, in the children. And, and it's very interesting that many of these children, they, they became interested in archaeology. So they, they actually are studying currently archaeology. Um, it's funny, here at UF, we are fighting for students uh, in, in the University of Trujillo. We have every class has around 60 students just in archaeology majors. So it's kind of, you know, uh, and because the professional market is also very big, Peru is a developing country, a lot of mining operations, big irrigation projects. So they do need a lot of archaeologists. So these people are making good money. Some of them, maybe 5% goes to research. So it's, it's not a bad deal. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the Chimu people. They were the... Um, they were the descendants of the Mochen. And just to give you an idea, the Chimu Empire was basically all along the coast of Peru, more than a thousand kilometers long, all the way up to present day Ecuador. At the same time, the Incas were expanding on the Southern Highlands. At some point, these people, you know, they, they, they knew each other already, but their political and economic interests became an issue. They had a long war, apart according to the Spanish chroniclers, and by about 1450 AD, the Incas took over the Chimus and became this very powerful empire. So they took over the, the Chimus, and the capital city of the Chimus was in Chan Chan, that is a city that is right next to my hometown, next to Trujillo City. And Chan Chan is also a world cultural heritage site, is the largest adobe brick city in the world. So let me show you, uh, here are some pictures. And the city itself is surrounded by an amazing uh, infrastructure of water irrigation canals, uh, a lot of aqueducts that brings water to the city. This in particular is a three kilometers long aqueduct that was taking water from one valley and taking it to Chan Chan that is somewhere there also serve as a dam. There is another canal known as La Cumbre, and this canal has around 49 miles, so roughly 80 kilometers long, all made without wheels, without beasts of burden. Llamas can only carry 30 pounds, 40 pounds, at least, uh, at the most, sorry. So these canals are beautifully done they have a they have a, a gradient of one in one hundred, so the engineers behind is simply amazing, and you know they they they, they were built all over the the deserts to bring waters from different valleys, and then Chan Chan itself, it's it's a city that has over twenty four square kilometers at the time of the Inca conquest. Now I'm putting a picture here with a scale of Colonial Trujillo, the city that was founded by Francisco Pizarro in, the, uh, in 1534, and look at the scale of Chan Chan right next door. So it's simply, you know, amazing the, 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 the size of the city, perhaps around, well, the, the, the most conservative estimates is like around 25,000 people lived in Chan Chan. I would say that around 60,000 people some people get crazy up to 100,000 may have lived in Chan Chan in the, fifth, in the 14th, 15th century. And uh, as you see a very complex uh, architecture, you will see some pictures in a minute. And it, this was the head, the capital city of this very large uh, Chimu empire that get kind of hidden, that get forgotten because of the Inca presence. You know, so when I, when I tell my students about, you know, party time, these are the guys who came late to the party, you know, and they sort of party of history, you know, so they, they missed. <laughs> so um, Chan Chan is, is considered a pre-industrial city, whatever industrial means, I'm not going to talk about it today, but the, uh, the core of the city is around nine, it's around six square miles, and uh, it's composed by, by large palaces. Each palace possibly built by a king or a queen. And we are learning now that perhaps many um, members of the same dynasty may have occupied these buildings. These are very large. Some of them have 
14, 25 hectares in extension, each of these palaces. When, when tourists come to, to Chan Chan, we usually spend from an hour to two hours just to walk within one palace. So they are significantly big. Um, this is another view. And in the background, you can see the modern city of Trujillo. Uh, Juan Chaco will be in this direction. So this is one of the palaces that is open for tourism. You can see here the, the ceremonial plazas, uh, storage facilities, the residential area for the king, um, water tanks, like large pools for storing water, and, and, and very important, the royal mausoleum. So all the kings and queens were, were buried in the same palace. And when, and this, is, this was perhaps some of the most beautiful areas of Chan Chan, but at the same time, it was the curse for this city because when the Spanish came in 1534, possibly the very same day that they came there, they learned that the city had all these treasures buried in these mausoleums. So from day one, the Spaniards started to loot these, 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 these burials. And according to the records, because if there is something that the Spanish have, we have to acknowledge that they like to put down in paper everything. You know, bureaucracy is something that we have inherited in Peru and it's crazy. So, uh, so according to those records, um, the, uh, and, and, they, and every single treasure that was found back in those days had to report, have to tax one fifth of everything that was taken to the king. So based on those reports, and of course, you don't know how much they put under the table, right? Um, some of the estimates goes to several millions of dollars in gold and silver, particularly silver taken from these monuments. So today they are heavily looted. Some of them are huge holes like this one right here. So we will never really know how these burials were, you know, assembly, what, we don't know what happened to the bodies. Probably they burn off the bodies. So it's going to be very difficult to learn about that. But there is this, this story that Chan Chan was, 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 uh, had all of these beautiful treasures and even today, some people believe that there are still, you know, huge treasures out there. That's what I'm digging there now. <laughs> uh, fortunately, the Peruvian government has been investing a lot of resources in excavating um, several areas of Chan Chan. Look at the scale here. There is one person. Look how big the avenues and the corridors of this city were. When you dig down, you can see very complex architecture the entrances to these palaces were beautifully decorated with, with wooden sculptures, some of them four to five feet tall. Here is a picture of some of those uh, sculptures, and some of them are not in great shape. I like to joke with my students that mo many of these are actually, it's not wood anymore, it's termite poop. And there was an article in National Geographic that, of course, I had nothing to do with, you know, about this termite poop. Uh, you know, they were very artistic, I have to say, these termites. Uh, but some of them are better preserved, and they are usually holding uh, shells. Um, they are not well seen here, but those were spondylus shells uh, that are shells from, from warmer waters <clears throat> that only live today in present day. Ecuador, in the coast of Ecuador. So espondilu shells, or as they, these people used to call them, muyu, were very valuable. They were so precious that when Pizarro landed in Tumbes, in the north coast of Peru, with his, with his troop, he was asking for, for valuable things, and, and, and local people handled him espondilu shells. And, and, and he said, are you joking me? You know, and, but, but for them, of course, gold and silver was important, but, but definitely, you know, the spondylus shells have a very special meaning on them. Now, the city of Chan Chan is beautifully decorated with mud friezes, basically emphasizing marine life. Um, there is all sort of fish and possibly the waves and the currents and then the seabirds along the shore. So every single palace had this decoration that reminds the ocean. And that probably had to do with the fact that the founder 
of the Chimu civilization was, they said that he came from the ocean. It was reported by the Spanish in some of their chronicles. So this, why, this guy name was Tai Kanamu. And apparently Tai Kanamu had, you know, this, this marine origin. And that's why maybe all this city has this kind of decoration. So you can see some pictures here. Um, the entrances to the plazas, sea otters, and pelicans usually, uh, fish nets, you know. So there's this very kind of, a lot of marine representations. Now, my own work is more focused in trying to understand how common people used to live in the city. I'm interested in learning how uh, the artisans and possibly the bureaucrats and all, all, all this bunch of this huge group of people that conforms the base of Chan Chan lived. So I've been working in one of the neighborhoods and these red lines here, you know, shows the circulation area. So basically the streets within this large um, neighborhood. This is around 10 square, 10 hectares of area. And the black thing shows my excavations. Now, the ones in yellow were excavated in the 1970s by Dr. Michael Mosley, who is an emeritus professor at UF and who led this project when he was at Harvard back in the 1960s. So Dr. Mosley is really the pioneer on Chimu studies I'm just trying to follow up his steps and I'm, I'm centering my research on this area. And we have found, um, this is with drone technology, everything is so much easier. We take pictures. So each of these, these numbers are the, the room numbers. This is a around, that will be in feet, maybe 1500 square feet plus minus uh, complex. Uh, with rooms and little patio areas. As I said, the conservation is so great that we have found cotton and spoon cotton, uh, little little balls with 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 a uh, spin cotton and some camelid fiber, human hair, little uh, spindles for uh, spinning the 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 um, the threads and and um, so there is a lot of a lot of uh, potential in learning about you know, the, the daily life of these people. So that's kind of my current interests. Now, the other aspect that I'm working on is about uh, human sacrifice. And uh, it turned out that as complex and as sophisticated as the Chimu people were, they were also doing a lot of sacrificial practices and they were particularly sacrificing children. So it happens that my excavations has uncovered but it seems to be the largest child sacrifice in the world, according to National Geographic. So, and I'm my scholars, I would say that we have agreed on this. And um, this is something that I didn't, I didn't expect. I was, one day I was working on my doctoral dissertation site and then someone came to me and he said, you know, there is a site next door, you should go and take a look. And um, I ended up going there and uh, we found the first evidence of these children, but then after the bioarchaeology done, we found that all of them were killed with a clean cut across the sternum. And they were possibly open up the rib cage to, to extract the heart. So uh, we, we had some antecedents in the 1960s as part of Dr. Mosley team in Huanchaco itself. He found a number of burials of children with llamas and, uh, but he didn't report human sacrifice because they didn't analyze the bones. So, but that discovery was there and was kind of odd. No one needs, knew exactly what was going on. Today, the site is a school and <clears throat> we have been excavating in the patio area. And actually we found more sacrificial victims and other very cool discoveries. But <clears throat> just to give you a brief uh, on this, uh, this is Chan Chan. This is the city of Trujillo downtown. This is uh, the colonial downtown. The city of Trujillo, Huanchaco is right there. This is the airport. And over the years, we have found over three sites with evidence of human sacrifice. Uh, the first one was Huanchaquito Las Llamas, and I'm going to show pictures of this. Then Pampa La Cruz, and more recent, a site that we call El Pollo. So the chicken is surrounded by chicken farms. So 
we, we call it El Pollo. So this is the site of Juan Chaquito Las Llamas, nothing impressive, nothing that would tell you that this is an important site, but sometimes sites like these are the ones that are, you know, uh, keeping some of the most interesting information. And in this area, we started the excavations and we found, and this is, you know, just to show you the distance between Chan Chan and the site, less than a mile. And this is the first picture that I took of the site, a bunch of human remains mixed with llama, with John Llama remains. I didn't know what I was digging. Just imagine I was a grad student and with a limited budget. And suddenly I was digging in a new site and my advisor at Yale was so upset with me. He said, what are you doing? Come back here. And I was spending the money in a different project. I didn't have a permit to dig to here, but at the end, everything get aligned very well. Uh, the press came immediately to the site. They were taking pictures. And I would say that the press really helped us to get some funding later. Um, and we've been really blessed because um, I was able to call my colleague, Nicolas Gopfer from the CNRS in France. He's a, um, a scholar associated with La Sorbonne University and, um, <clears throat> and, the, Natural, and the Museum of Natural History in Paris and Dr. John Verano at Tulane University, who happens to be the most well, the most renowned bioarchaeologist for the Andean region. And the three of us were able to dig in this site, taking care of the archaeology, the soil archaeology part of Lamas, then the bioarchaeology, and me just directing the whole project, trying to you know, put all the pieces together. So these are some pictures of these children. They were very young between the ages of around from five to eight years old, and then from nine to 11. We have a third group between 11 and 15. They were all buried with llamas. And, um, and these were also young llamas. So, um, you know, I, I can answer some questions afterwards. Um, the preservation was really good. So um, at the beginning, we were even able to see the hairstyles and, um, and the preservation, as I said, was astonishing. The bodies were placed in different positions. Some of them had their faces painted on red using a, a pigment made of cinnabar. Cinnabar is a mercury-based mineral that happens to be only in one geological source in Peru, in the south central highlands of Peru. Some of them were placed in very odd positions. As you can see here, some of them were were with their mouth in their hands. And I thought that it was just a casualty. But later on, digging in a different site, uh, we found also evidence that most of these children had their, you know, their, their hands here. They had turbans and bandanas sometimes, some little headdresses, uh, the red painting, as I said. And again, the llamas. The llamas were also very young, less than one year old. And they were mostly brown. So the coat was mostly brown. And because of the preservation, we were able to actually see you know, the, the coat color. Uh, this is a map showing the distribution. In total, 137 children and three adults, and around 205 llamas were found in this site. All of them killed at the same time, all of them buried at the same time, according to our radiocarbon dates. Um, some of the children had the rib cage open, as you can see here, is, is, is displaced. So they were possibly ripping out the heart. And uh, <clears throat> we thought that this is the most likely explanation. We are currently working with physicians trying to understand why they were cutting through the sternum to reach out the heart because the Aztecs did kind of the same, but they were cutting on the soft tissue here on the abdominal area and then inserting the hand all the way up to the heart. So there must be something else that we are missing here and hopefully we will figure this out soon. Here are the pictures of the sternums. Uh, the manubrium particularly, as you know, these are infused bones in subadults. And, uh, and, and, and the bone, you know, is, is, is very sharply crossed, uh, cut it. So there is no really evidence that the bone was growing back, which means that this is, in forensic terms, is a perimortem injury, which means that, you know, this possibly caused the death of these, of these uh, children. 
This is just to show the location of the cut marks. We also found an adult, which we, who, we, I mean, we think that this could have been the sacrificer, the guy who actually killed the children, and that then he was also killed, but we haven't found any evidence of the, um, you know, any, any petty mortem injury, at least on the bone. So maybe he was poisoned, he was strangulated, we don't know for sure. And in terms of the llamas, uh, we knew that the llamas were sacrificed by the Incas in great numbers. Um, Juan Poma de Ayala, one of the um, one of the chroniclers, native chroniclers during the 16th, 17th century, he painted a um, um, Andean official um, extracting the heart of llamas, and this is a practice that ex still ex exists today. There are several work, ethnographic work done on llama sacrifice, but don't, don't get me wrong if we think that these people are doing brutal things, because on the one hand, these llamas uh, are sacrificed to, for the well-being of the community. They are usually sacrificed after the llamas are, are treated, usually as, as people, la, llama herders in the Andean mountains they treat llamas as, as people and they, they treat them so well, they assign their names and, uh, and they feel really bad when they do this, but they always say that this is for the goodwill of all, the, of all their communities. So there is always one that is sacrificed. Uh, one of my former professors made the argument, although significantly different, of course, that you know, when, when we send our people to the army, you know, to protect our rights of freedom and liberty and so forth, we are kind of doing the same, you know. So in this case, these llamas are part of the sacrificial. And then, of course, the big question is, is the children, what it meant to sacrifice the children? And I have to say that I don't have an answer yet. We can have a conversation about this. I have many options, but uh, it's, it's something that, of course, is difficult to digest, is difficult to explain. But as an anthropologist, I can say that my 21st, 20, 19th century perspective is very is, is completely different to the one that people had 500 years ago. Um, I, I teach the class of the archaeology of violence. I'm currently teaching that class. And you know, my mother, she doesn't like this, but every time my very first, my very first slide is when I show the uh, on the one hand, I show the Aztec sacrifices, and then on the other, I put a picture of a, of a crucified Christ. And I tell my students, what would happen if for some reason, you know, all the history of our civilization disappeared, and then 3,000 years later, someone come here, and, they, and there is no written records, there is no internet, and then suddenly everyone start to find crucifix with a, with a person that is crucified and sometimes with blood coming out. People will say, well, these were people that, 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 that killed their, you know, probably their delinquents or they were killing someone that didn't deserve to live and they were placing them in a terrible way with a lot of suffering and even, even worse, I mean, they seem to be worshiping this person. While for the believers, that's actually completely the opposite. It's the story of love and redemption and hope. So we don't know what really means the, the child sacrifice. And, and we need to try to understand, you know, when I, when I found this, I, I, was, I wasn't a father yet. And then when, I, when my two boys were born, my mind completely changed because I can't imagine doing that to any child, right? So there are many things that we need to consider here. But still, I think it's a, it's a good um, exercise. Here are some pictures of the llamas. They were killed in the same way with cuts across the, 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 the fifth and the third uh, ribs and in the sternebra as well. And there are some depictions in Chimu art of officials killing llamas for, for sacrifice. So I don't know how we are doing with time. We are about, yes. So I may, I may stop here. I had another few slides, but I know that we have to be you know, on time. So I may stop here and I will be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.
he, he warned me that he has to pick up one of his children. So uh, he's, we have another 15 minutes. Um, I would like to, before I forget, to recommend a book, The Inca and Their Ancestors by Michael Mosley, who he met, uh, Dr. Prieto mentioned. Uh, this is sort of the book uh, first published. I'm sure there are many others now, but uh, it was extremely informative. And Dr. Mosley also talks about the cyclicity uh, of the El Nino phenomenon, not in terms of five or seven years, but rather there's a 500 year cycle where there are enormous El Ninos. And that's why you see all this sand because it has washed down where El Nino, it rains and it rains and it rains. And essentially the coastal civilizations are not destroyed, but greatly weakened and at that time the civilizations in the mountains tend to take over. So there's this back and forth cyclicity. Do you agree with that? Um, yeah, I mean, the cycle, yes. Um, Dr. Uh, Mosley had a, an environmental uh, catastrophe approach to the demise of ancient civilizations. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have currently challenged those ideas because many of the sites that back in those days with the limited excavations that he did, um, we came back to those sites and mm -hmm. we have found that those sites weren't abandoned and that people keep living there. Yeah. So El Nino was definitely a factor that 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 hit people in different ways in the economic, political mm -hmm. matters, but but it didn't disappear or destroy civilizations. Right. Right. And th then there would be periods of extreme drought. Mm -hmm and uh, everything dried out and the winds would blow the sand up into dunes and it's amazing that people continued living there at all today uh, and i would also like to point out that the moche the preceding civilization to chan chan also practiced human sacrifice and as i recall um, they tended to bury a child under the foundation of a new building yeah so this is a long tradition, a long practice. Okay. Let's go right to Zoom. End of my lecture. And Reiskind, John Reiskind on Zoom, go ahead. Yeah, this is blow my mind. I am, I feel so ignorant. And this has been a great talk, unbelievable. Let me ask you uh, about deities in general, or uh, I don't see much mention of, of them in, in this, uh, is is there any evidence of a of a, a worship of a higher power? You had that list of natural uh, natural uh, the nature, the sea, the ocean, the moon, the sun. But is is there much evidence of deities involved in their cultures? Um, well, thank you for that question. That's a really good <clears throat> one. Um, there were many deities. Um, before the Inca, certainly. And, um, you know, it would take another talk to describe them. But um, we know the ones that were worshipped close to the time of the of the Spanish conquest, but not the ones before them. And uh, in this case, art history has really supplied and helped us to figure out, to propose the existence of different deities Specifically in the Moche art, there seems to be a guy who um, was an um, he was known as Ayapaik, and in the local language that was Muchik, that would be the decapitator. But this guy had different different uh, hierophanies. He was expressing himself as a big strombus shell, and then as a big crab. Then he would be the maize guy. So. Uh, there are multiple ways of understanding um, Andean deities. Uh, for the Chimu in particular, we know that they were worshiping the moon. And even people today, when you go to Huanchaco, for example, and you ask them about ancient deities or you know former, they would say, well, the moon, because the moon has the power to show up at night, but also during the day, and the sun can't. You know, and there is, of course, a practical aspect. The practical aspect is that, you know, many, and even here in the U.S., I have learned 
many farming and fishing societies will use the lunar cycle as a most effective way that is really, you know, synchronized with the environment to grow your plants or to go for good fishing days. So the moon was very important for them and they, they, they were big, but of course, when the, when the Incas came, they, they imposed the call to the sun. Just like, like back in the days of Akhenaton, they were trying to bring the sun as the god in the ancient Egypt, um, the Incas were trying to do the same with the sun. And that was the thing that really pissed off everyone around because they want to keep their traditional and ancient deities. But yeah, that is something that we will need, you know, there is also these goddesses and, you know, related with Mother Earth and so forth. So there are many other, many other ones, but that will be a, that will be a doctoral dissertation in itself. <laughs> but thank you. The, the, the Moche also built a Huaca del Sol. You had a Huaca de la Luna that you showed us, but there, they also had Huaca del Sol, yeah. which had been mostly destroyed by the Spaniards. The, the looters, there was industrial looting. They developed a hydraulic system where they could bring water in and not, under pressure, they would just tear it apart, looking for gold, looking for gold. Okay, audience, questions, comments? Yes, hold on, one moment. I read the uh, book, Lord of Sipan, and uh, there is a reference in there to an unusually large, valuable collection of Inca, or not, well, artifacts from that area that was taken by uh, UCLA. Uh, do you know anything about that incident and that situation? Um, I don't know which book, ex book um, exactly, um, Dr. Walter Alva, the Peruvian director of the CIPAM project, he made a strong alliance with UCLA professor uh, Christopher Donan, who is one of the fathers of Mochi archaeology. And as far as I know, um, that's not the case. I think that uh, they were uh, working very closely. Uh, as a matter of fact, thank you. Last last year. We, uh, we had a homage in honor of Walter Alba in Los Angeles. And I was there and, and, and Dr. Donan was talking about, you know, Dr. Alba and we had a very nice moment there. Um, all of the artifacts were actually sent, all of the artifacts for restoration were shipped to, to Germany because Dr. Alba had connections in the, in the Berlin and the Linden Museum at Stuttgart. And they were the ones doing the conservation of the copper artifacts. And as you can imagine, you know, the rigidity and the, you know, all the, the pulchritude on the, on, the, on the scientific work by the Germans, they sent everything back. Uh, and those, all of those things are now on display in the museum. Now, before the excavation, the scientific excavations at Sipan, the site was discovered <clears throat> by a group of former uh, Peruvian Navy and Air Force group that apparently were, you know, in contact with local looters. I don't remember exactly how it was, or, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there were only local looters who were digging in the site and they, um, and they found a, a, another royal burial who was completely destroyed. And apparently some of the looters, uh, they, they went to the local bar and they got drunk and they didn't have how to pay the beer and they were paying with pieces of gold. And then they were, the police was told about this. And then they went 3 a.m. in the morning to see Dr. Alba. They were knocking his door and Walter, who is a good friend of mine, he said that he didn't want to open the door <laughs> at that time. But you know, he 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 responded to the call. He opened the door, and the police officer said to him, "You won't believe what I have." And he showed two beautiful pieces of gold, and he was surprised. Where did you get this? And they ended up working in Sipan. So many artifacts went into the Peruvian, you know, illegal art market, and then those pieces were shipped to Europe and to the U.S. But uh, but Alba and the Peruvian government at the time they they made a deal with the FBI 
and with the local authorities in Peru, the US, and the American embassy in Lima. And they were able to confiscate many of the pieces that, you know, in matter of months were already here in, in the US. And those were returned to Peru. And those are on display in the very last hall of the Sipan Museum. So maybe those are the ones that you are referring, but, yeah. but not with UCLA. <laughs> What, what we see now in those museums and what is also in the Museo de Oro in Bogota mm -hmm. is incredible, the workmanship, the beauty. Mm -hmm. And to think that the Spaniards were melting it down in order to more efficiently ship it back to Spain, just the destruction is incredible. Those, um, those pictures or the reconstruction that you showed of the palaces and there was the fish carved into it. What was the material there? What did they use for the construction? Oh, mud. Mud. Just mud? Just and mud. it lasted. Well, they have done a lot of analysis. You know, it's, it's mud mixed with sand. Yeah. Uh, but it's basically mud. I mean, technically mud. Okay. And the other question I had was when you showed the pictures and you've been talking about it, about the gold that those those men with those gold clothes, where were they buried? Underground or in the mountain like the Egyptians did or just they, underground? That's a good question. Though they were buried in uh, burial chambers underneath, under the surface. So they, so some of these, some of these chambers had around, um, 50 to 80 square meters. And they were buried also with retainers, people that were sacrificed with them to help these lords or these ladies in the afterlife, so. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Prieto. Thank you.